So uh, administrative details, anybody that wants access to the Wi-Fi, the Google Guest access point is open. Um, we'll do Q&A, so feel free, for those of you who have read the book and have questions about the book, feel free to uh, get those teed up. Ken will be walking around with a mic, and we do that, and we can all hear each other, but uh, for the recording that we're doing, and we'll share with the portfolio um, later, that way we don't have to repeat the questions. Um, Anything else before we jump in, or shall we, uh, shall we get started? We can get started. Um, how, um, before, I, before we get going, how, I'm assuming most of you haven't read it, because then I can kind of go into some details about what's in it without feeling like I'm being repetitive. Is that OK? OK, good. Fire away. All righty. Uh, well, thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, my name is Rick Clow. I'm a partner at Google Ventures. Um, one of the things we're trying out this year, we're going to do more of, are bringing authors in. Uh, to talk about their book, either the industry that they cover. In a couple of months, we've got a novelist coming who's, who's got a science fiction novel coming out, um, who's going to talk about uh, the space that he writes about. But um, very excited to kick this off uh, with Fred, who's written a great book. I, uh, I took some time over the holidays to, to read through it. Um, kind of fascinating when you read a book when you're familiar with about half of the story. right? So for those who haven't read the book, um, what Dogfight talks about is the inside story of the development of both iOS and the iPhone and Android, uh, both as a platform and, and eventually as a series of devices, um, and talks about how uh, earth-shaking those two developments were, how they both influenced each other in some unpredictable ways. And uh, having been at Google for most of the time that Android grew up and then was launched, uh, really fascinating when you see people's names who you, know, you used to share office space with, or in the case of Wes Chan, who, who sits upstairs. Um, so uh, really it, it, looking forward to hearing more color from Fred about the book. Uh, I've got some questions teed up. Um, looking forward to hearing questions from those of you in the audience, um, and, uh, and really just looking forward to a, to a pretty colorful conversation. So Fred, why don't you start out, this is a, a space you've covered for a long time, um, what led you to this as the focal point for the book? And what are some of the key themes that you tease out through, throughout the story? Well, thanks for coming, guys. Um, I Actually, I spent a fair amount of time thinking about, well, let me back up. Um, the book grew out of stories I wrote for Wired. Uh, in 2008 and 2009 and 2010. Um, I, it was pretty obvious when the iPhone came out that it was going to be a big deal. Um, not just because it was a gadget, but because that Steve Jobs had come out with, but because it was very quickly obvious that it was a, the first pocket computer that, I mean, the first computer that fit in your pocket that actually you'd want to buy. And, once, um, and then when Android came out, it was pretty obvious, maybe at least to me, that not only was there going to be a pretty good competition between the two, but that um, the friendship that Google and Apple had was going to pretty quickly deteriorate. Um, I think that, and so I took a look at that and thought, well, there's probably a really good story in there. Um, usually when you get two big companies going at it like that, there's um, a pretty good backstory. But it, it was more, there was more to it than that. What I came to, what I started to really realize was that what, what I, we were witnessing was essentially the PC revolution all over again. That um, what happened in the early 1980s was essentially replaying itself uh, once again. That we were actually going to have a platform war um, the way Apple and Microsoft had in the 1980s. And that that fight was going to go on for quite some time. Uh, and so I thought that there were a lot of different threads just in there that would pull, that, 
that were more than a magazine piece could tackle. And then what I started to kind of, then what I started to realize was as, the, as I was using my phone, I think this, I started to realize this after the tablet came out, but as I started to use my phone and my tablet to watch um, TV and baseball and uh, sporting events and other kinds of things, what I came to start to realize was that this really wasn't just a fight about who was going to be king of the hill in high tech, but that this was actually the whole convergence revolution that we'd been talking about uh, for the past 30 years actually starting to happen. That up until, that up until then, the devices that actually existed to drive, to drive convergence really weren't very good. And that for the first time, actually, we had devices where essentially you could turn the analog world into a series of hyperlinks. So you, know, you see something, you know, you're on the bus and you see a billboard for uh, movie X and all of a sudden you could watch it on your um, iPhone or your Android phone. And so you added all those things together and I thought that, that, that putting a box around that would be a pretty good way to sort of give people a sense of what was happening right now, but also where the future was going. And so that's, I'm trying to think that's, and then as I kind of dug into it, what I started to, um, what I started to come to understand was that there was an even greater purpose to all of this, which is that people don't really understand Silicon Valley at all, even today. Um, and I would say, People outside of Silicon Valley look at companies like Google and Apple and Facebook and all the and all the very big companies here with a fair amount of awe and suspicion. Um, no matter how good they are at trying to kind of give people a sense as to how they operate, but I also started to kind of understand that even people inside the valley didn't really understand how these companies operated. I think that one of the things that we all lose sight of is that Apple and Google and all these companies um, have just as much trouble getting stuff off the ground as, uh, as small companies do, maybe even a harder time. And so I kind of thought that all those things made it make sense to kind of pull a book together. Talk to me a little bit about if you contrast the two styles, right? So you have Apple. One of the things that fascinated me, that's of course the side of the story I was least familiar with. Um, I had no idea that Steve Jobs had effectively set two di divisions in the company at war against each other in the development of what became the iPhone. Um, people were picking sides. There was quite a bit of animosity inside the company uh, where people who were on uh, one team actively disliked the other, uh, quite a bit of infighting. Mm -hmm. Contrasted with a style that I'm more familiar with at Google, which is this creative chaos where people are just encouraged to try things out, see what works, see what sticks against the wall, and then do more of what works and less of what doesn't. Um, anything in either of those styles that you felt were uh, critical to the success of either of these two platforms? Do you, do you think there are lessons to be learned from either of those styles? Um, I think there are lessons to be learned from, well, first, uh, I think there are definitely lessons to be learned, but probably not the ones that are um, uh, maybe the most obvious. Um, for starters, while Apple, while Apple certainly, while the politics inside of Apple are, Apple's a very, very difficult place to work. Um, I don't know what it's like to work now, but certainly while Steve was running it, it was a very, very difficult place to work. Um, people would, uh, you know, it's a deeply political place run by a despot. Um, and uh, I don't know that that makes it that much different than many companies, but, um, but actually, I think there are more. I, what I was trying, the point I was trying to make is, is that I actually think there are more similarities than differences in the way Android was put together and the iPhone was put together or iOS was put together than differences. Um, 
By that I mean, even though Google is the company, is a very collaborative place, uses creative chaos to kind of get all, to kind of allow a thousand flowers to bloom and to kind of get things, uh, and the 20% time has been responsible for all manner of really interesting projects. Um, the development of the Android uh, software and the whole Android initiative was much more like, developed much more the, way, the same way that the iOS and iPhone and iPad developed than anything else at hmm. Google typically, typically happens. So Android itself, one of the really interesting things and one of the difficult parts about Android, I think, for Google as an organization was that in order for, in order for Android to succeed, Andy Rubin effectively had to, to wall his team off from the rest of Google. Um, because in order to actually build, to build a consumer product um, that you know, would meet a deadline that would be ready on a certain date, um, that would meet the carriers uh, uh, and, manuf and other manufacturers' um, requirements, required an approach to doing business that was almost the ant antithetical um, approach to the way the rest of Google operated, um, um, where most of Google software is most of Google's success has been driven by the fact that you built a piece of software, you got it to a certain point, and then you threw it over the wall and kind of let the rest of the world mess around with it to sort of iron out all the kinks. Well, when you're building a phone um, or building phone software as Android was doing, that doesn't work at all. Um, you actually have to meet, you actually have to meet deadlines. I mean, if you know, if a certain piece of software that Google is developing isn't ready on time, um, you know, you just wait and you throw it over the wall when it's ready. If the phone software that's going into um, a phone isn't ready for the Christmas um, buying season, um, you might as well not do it for another year uh, in the cell phone business. And so, um, in some respects, there was there were more similarities than differences in, in the way in the way that that operated, um, and so there was a fair amount of tension that I go into in the book about um, between the part of the organization that Vic Gondotra ran, which was the part that was partnering the part of Google that was partnering with Apple, and then the part of the organization that Andy Rubin ran, which was the whole organization that was building Android, and. Um, they were most definitely in competition with each other for a period of time, and I think that that was, um, uh, it's actually a testament to the way Google is managed and, uh, and run that uh, it as an organization was able to handle that kind of tension because that's the sort of thing that could have messed up the project very easily. And you talk about the need for Android initially to be run similarly to Apple, but then go on to demonstrate that Android's success in large part has been due to the fact that it's an open platform on which anybody can build, or just about anybody. Um, how do you contrast those two approaches in the App Store, for instance, uh, Apple famously uh, disallowing certain apps from companies, Google and otherwise? Um, are, are those two approaches necessary components of the success of each? Could Apple have been more open? Could Android have succeeded copying the Apple playbook? How do you think about those two approaches? Um, I think that there's actually less to them than um, people would like to, than a lot of people would like to um, admit. Uh, I feel a little I feel like I need to be a little careful about how I phrase that, and given the walls that I th th that, that I'm no, no. inside. But I, but but I think that I think that when Android was built, it started out 
as a, uh, I truly believe that Andy and the whole team really thought that uh, the whole open part of the platform was indeed uh, something that was going to differentiate them from the rest of from the rest of from Apple and the rest of the marketplace. I think what's pretty clear from my reporting uh, is that over time they came to understand that uh, in order to really make Android work, uh, they needed to actually get more and more and more control over it. So if you actually look at sort of the history of the evolution of Android over the course of, over the, course of the past five years, yes, it started out as a very, very open platform um, where Google said, uh, come one, come all, here's our free software, you can do anything you want with it. Um, I think if you look at the way things are today, technically that's true, but as a practical matter, it's less and less and less true. Um, I think that uh, you know the Nexus devices, buying Motorola, um, and some of the other things that Google is doing are all efforts to actually move the whole project to be more Apple-like than anything else. Because what people were starting to realize, I mean, and this was a real problem, and this remains a problem, but it's actually, Google is actually getting on top of it, is that, the, is that if you don't exercise a huge amount of control over the software platform, the, you wind up with a developer ecosystem that is not unified. Um, and I don't want to use the word fragmented because it's become kind of, it's become kind of a, uh, it's, it's become a little bit of a loaded phrase, but it is absolutely true that one of the problems that Android has had and is very conscious of and is dealing with quite successfully is that it's actually, um, is that the number of people who are on the current version of the OS used to be minuscule. Um, um, I think the number of people, I think the half, I feel like a year and a half ago, Half the people, half the Android phones out there were two or three software upgrades um, behind. So, I mean, that's a little bit like having half the iPhones out there be on iOS 5 um, instead of iOS 7. Um, and, it, you know, if you talk to developers, they would tell you that it was a huge, huge problem for them. And ultimately, since this is about platforms, keeping developers happy is long term in everybody's best interest. So I'm going to shift uh, gears slightly. I think the favorite, my favorite passage in the book was, had to do with the glass, right? The conversation, the, 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 the whole piece where you talk about Steve Jobs seeking out, was it Corning? Yeah. Right? And the, the, the gorilla glass. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about that. I, I was fascinated to hear the history of Gorilla Glass, which long predates cell phones. Right. Um, but then that is a necessary component of what became the iPhone, and, and now a, a staple on seemingly every device. Right. The, um, the, story about, the story about the glass is one of those great, about the, about the glass screen on the iPhone is one of those great sort of um, accidents of uh, that make innovation in Silicon Valley so fascinating and interesting. Um, and what made, and one of the things that sort of demonstrates to me sort of the power of having um, an entrepreneur like Jobs running the show. Uh, so there was a huge discussion when the iPhone was being designed about what the screen was going to be, what material the screen was going to be. Was it going to be plexiglass? Was it going to be glass? Um, and they had long conversations. This is a 
year and a half before the phone shipped about the pros and cons of each. Um, and ultimately what they concluded was that it needed to be plexiglass because you couldn't actually put glass on a phone because everybody was going to drop it. And you couldn't actually have, any, have a phone where the screen actually shattered every time somebody dropped the phone. Thank God uh, that never happens. Um, <laughs> uh, and so the whole production process was set up for the next year to manufacture the phone um, with a plexiglass screen. Uh, one day, Steve Jobs is walking around with one of the uh, prototype phones. He pulls it out of his pocket and notices that the screen is scratched. The key's in his pocket. His phone is in the pocket. His keys were in the pocket. His keys scratched the plexiglass screen. Walks into the Monday meeting that they, were, that they had every week and said, we gotta, we gotta change the screen. Well, it turned into something of a, you know, he wound up yelling a little bit um, because there were some, because there, because there were some, because there were some minor objections from his staff. And initially you would kind of go, well, why wouldn't you just do what Steve Jobs said? And the reason was because Steve, wa Steve was in having this conversation with them, I think, in about September or October of 2006. So two and a half or three months before Steve Jobs was going to show the iPhone to the world, he said to his staff, we need, to change, we need to change the material that the screen for the phone is going to be. And in fact, the phone that, ski that Steve unveiled to the world still had a plexiglass screen and during the six months between the time that the phone was unveiled and the time that actually went, went, went for sale, um, among the many, many things that they did, they actually changed, they actually switched out the screen. Well that was, you know, that was in and of itself a, I mean, that was in and of itself a m huge innovation. So um, there's there's a story about how Steve picks up the phone and calls the head of Corning Glass and says, this is Steve Jobs, I want to try to kind of do this and that and the next thing. And they won't put him through because the person on the, uh, at the switchboard thinks that the person on the other end of the line is joking because nobody picks up the phone and says, calls the switchboard for Corning and says, I'm Steve Jobs. Now, this, this doesn't come from my reporting. This comes from um, out of uh, Walter Isaacson's book. But uh, ultimately, Steve's, Steve convinced the head of Corning Glass that not only did he have a product, a material that, he want, that Steve Jobs wanted for the phone, a kind of glass, but that the CEO of Corning could actually convince his manufacturing team to make enough of it for the first shipment of iPhones in something like two months. You know, some un incredibly short period of time. Um, well, sure enough, you know. Uh, I, one of my sadnesses in reporting the book is, is that I didn't get a chance to go to Asia and talk to uh, some of the people who were on the front lines of that decision. because. Mm -hmm getting, because that would have made for two or three chapters of the book on its own. But reporting is an inexact science and you take what you can get sometimes. But I think that there's an amazing story there. And did, did he know that Corning had developed this material like 50 years ago? I don't and think he did. No, no, no. I don't think he did at all. I think that, I think that he knew I think that he knew that he, want, that he wanted it to be glass and he needed it not to shatter. And uh, he left it up to he left it up to Jeff Williams and the rest of and, and the rest of the um, sort of production team to figure that out. Uh, but yeah, the glass was ultimate, ultimately the glass that they chose was glass that Corning developed, I think, in the Korean War for fighter pilot 
um, for fighter jets, for the cockpits of fighter jets. And uh, for whatever reason, it ultimately was never used. But so this was actually the first application of this kind of glass formula uh, that had been sitting around on a shelf for 50 years. Just amazing. All right, let's, uh, let's talk about Android. OK. Um, so you talk about when you shift gears from the very dramatic. If you haven't read the book yet, I've got to say that the, the chapter is about the months leading up to the iPhone launch, right? the, the, the demo right, right. of Macworld, when, when Steve Jobs gets up on, 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 uh, on stage. And I think we all had the impression that it was a polished, ready to ship device. And you make pretty clear that it was anything but. Um, but at the same time, Android was well underway by that point. And it was underway not because Google was afraid of Apple coming out with something. It, was, it becomes clear in what you report that there was real fear here in Mountain View that Windows was going to own the mobile market and was going to lock Google out. Yep. Um, that clearly has not proven to be the case, right. to put it mildly. How far back do you have to rewind the clock to get to a fork in the road where Microsoft could have done something different and been relevant mm -hmm. in this discussion today? Well, let me back up. I mean, before, we, before I go there, I want to try to kind of give you guys sort of some sense of uh, what Rick was talking about when he said that uh, the iPhone, when it was unveiled, looked like you could buy it in a store, but was nowhere near that. Um, to give you some sense as to the kind of pressure and tension that uh, the team was under, um, Andy Grignon, who was one of the who now runs Quake Labs, uh, but who was the engineer in charge of all the radios at the time, uh, said he and all the engineers that were working on getting the iPhone ready for launch were so nervous about the demo failing that they were sitting in the fifth row doing shots of scotch. Um, um, and you know what he took me through and what he and others sort of took me through was the story was the story of real human of a bunch of people, a bunch of mortals trying to, do, trying to make an, an immortal device and uh, running into all manner of issues that would never have occurred to any of us, but which, uh, but when you actually see them, you actually start to understand just what an accomplishment it was. I mean, to give you a, to give you a for instance, the, the Wi-Fi antenna on the iPhone prototype worked so badly and so unreliably that they actually ran, um, they actually soldered uh, antenna wire to the phone and then ran it out off stage so that um, uh, it would connect. Um, the well, cell phone, the cell phone itself was like so unreliable that they hard coded it to always show five bars. Um, the, uh, um, because they knew that the phone call that Steve was going to make during the demonstration would probably work, but they also knew that during the 90 minutes that the phone was up on the screen, uh, the phone would probably crash once or twice, and they didn't want the world sort of seeing the bars going from five to four to three to two to one and then back up again. Um, and so th one of the things that I think we all forget as laymen and entrepreneurs is that building this stuff is incredibly hard for whether or not you're Apple or Google or um, just a startup, and that the innovation process is, no matter 
whether or not you're a little company or an enormous company with enormous resources, is not linear whatsoever. Um, that, it, uh, that even though everybody likes to kind of make it seem linear, uh, even at the biggest companies, it's not linear in any way, shape, or form. But to answer the question directly uh, about Microsoft, Google was working on Android starting as early as 2005 when, um, uh, Larry, when, when Larry bought um, Andy Rubin's company. And uh, in fact, actually had a phone that looked like a Blackberry that they'd planned to unveil September, October of 2007, but had to actually push a year once the iPhone uh, came out. But the thing about, but what people forget and what Rick pointed out is that Apple and Google in 2006 were friends. Um, not only friends, but, um, but not only business partners, but close personal friends. I mean, Larry and Sergey and Steve Jobs were um, socialized together. Eric Schmidt sat on Apple's board. Um, uh, and the foundation of this partnership was that Apple was that, remember, this is 2005, 2006. Both companies were still desperately worried about Microsoft, which is hard to believe now. But in 2005, Apple and Google were worried that Windows Mobile, which had Microsoft had been trying to get off the ground for like four or five years, was actually starting to get some traction. And both companies, having fought Microsoft uh, at various points, uh, over the previous decades, and I guess I would include Eric Schmidt in this um, in his previous life at um, uh, Sun and, 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 and at Novell, they both felt like that if Microsoft's mobile, Windows mobile business actually got some traction, that that could be an enormous problem for Google as a business because while there were all sorts of rules and regulations about what Microsoft could do um, on the desktop with its browser, um, it had to offer choice of search engines, um, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it actually couldn't use, it actually couldn't leverage its Windows monopoly on the desktop to mess up Google's business, for example. There were no such rules about what it could or couldn't do uh, on the mobile platform where it didn't have a monopoly at all. And so what Google was desperately worried about was that uh, um, it would essentially have to, is that Microsoft would wind up getting some traction in, uh, Windows, in Windows Mobile and then start cutting Google off from its advertising customers uh, uh, that way. And so both Apple and Google teamed up thinking that like the enemy was Microsoft. And it was only, it took about a year and a half, but by the end of 2007, it was pretty clear to the folks at Google that um, Microsoft was not the one that they needed to worry about. Uh, I want to pause. Uh, we have a mic. Um, who's got questions in the room about what we've been talking about, about a separate topic? Okay, we'll come up here, uh, maybe right here, and then we'll, there you go. Hey, uh, Graham Hancock, I work at Google Ventures upstairs. So hey. uh, I read the book over the holidays, and in a couple of days, I just couldn't put it down. It was uh, just all of the new information was, was so interesting to me, especially the iPhone presentation about how, uh, how it was all kind of chewing gum and bailing wire. I think that that's, <laughs> that. And I, I went and rewatched the keynote, the iPhone introduction keynote, with that in mind, and it's a much more interesting experience. <laughs> like after having seen it, and just to know that in the background or in the fifth row, there's people doing shots after each <laughs> demo. It's it's it was incredible. Uh, but to me, I think the thing I came away with was at the point in the book when there's there's this sense that uh, there's a growing distrust between the two companies. Um, 
And I, I really, I honed in on the fact that Steve Jobs seemed so trusting of Google during that time. He's like, they wouldn't screw us, they wouldn't do this. And he, he sort of, to his detriment, kept playing that line saying, you know, I trust them, they won't, they won't do something to uh, hurt our relationship. And, and it turns out they, that's exactly what was going on. Android was exactly what they had feared it would be. Um, and I think that, that that just colored colored my perception of him a little bit, just that he was that trusting. And um, what what did you find when you were interviewing people for the book uh, that you know that they were saying about? Well, do they think that he was being a little naive, or does do they think that that was just sort of his core you know, a trait of his of of himself that he would be trusting of his business partners like that? I think it was a comment. I mean, like like all human emotions, it was probably, it, first of all, I, I don't know because I didn't talk to him. Um, but I can, I think I can, I've talked to a lot of people and we talked a lot about this exact point. And it wound up being sort of a multifaceted, uh, the answer winds up being multifaceted. The first, an the first part is that I think he really did believe that Larry and Sergey were his friends and wouldn't screw him in that way. Um, and I think that, you know, like all CEOs, um, I think Steve felt like he was a really good judge of character. And so it, it's very, very if you believe that you're a very good judge of character and if you have proven over the years that you are such a good job of, that you have are such a good judge of character that you've built this mega corporation of people around you um, you are probably going to maybe be a little bit slower to kind of doubt yourself but the other thing that I think that needs to kind of get factored into the mix is, is that he was a lot sicker um, during all of this than I think any of us knew at the time. Uh, you know, in, you know, that in trying to, I'm trying to remember, you know, he had a, I mean, remember during 2008, so the iPhone comes, the iPhone is unveiled in 2007, it comes out in the middle of 2007, Android shows up at the end of 2007, and at the beginning of 2008, Steve starts to get sick. He starts to really get sick. I mean, it's quite clear from reading Walter Isaacson's book that he was sick all along. But, you know, 2008, we all remember, was when um, in the middle of 2008, was, I think all of us remember, was when he was on stage and looked like he had lost 40 pounds. And that was when Apple, I think, said that he had been suffering from a common bug. Um, um, but it was really obvious that something was, something was wrong. And I think all of us, I think, didn't believe that, I think all of us didn't believe that his cancer had come back, but I think it was really quite obvious that something was up. That was, uh, and so I guess the answer is, is if you want my opinion, I think that he was, I think because he was a lot sicker than we all thought he was, I think that probably made him a little bit slower to move um, than, than he might have. There's, a, there's, another aspect to, there's another aspect to this too, though. Um, Apple and Google were not only intertwined from a friendship perspective, um, they were, their boards were also completely intertwined. So um, Al Gore is on Apple's board. He's a very close advisor to Google. Um, um, I'm blanking on, you know, Bill Campbell was on the board and Steve Jobs' best friend. He's a very close advisor to Google. I mean, there were a whole bunch of very, very important, powerful executives. Um, 
who effectively were on the same board, who were essentially on the board of Apple and on the board of Google. And I think that even if Jobs had personally felt betrayed, it was going to be difficult for him to quickly do something about it because it wasn't just his call. We had another question over here. Uh, hey there. Um, I have a couple questions for you. They're both related. Uh, my first question is uh, with these two large companies, one of which is you know, known for its secrecy, Apple, um, you know, how did you get this type of information out of them? Did you have any official access, if any? And do you think um, a lot of the information you're able to get and the people you're able to encounter, uh, was that in large part because of your uh, background as a journalist? Um, I think that, I'm trying to think about where to start. Um, I talked to, I probably talked to about 100, more than 100 people for the book. Uh, Apple, I didn't have any official access from Apple, um, which probably won't surprise you. Um, um, although I did tell them about the book um, at every step of the way. Um, and I had some access at Google. I talked um, to, uh, I talked to Alan Eustace a little bit. I talked to Eric a little bit. I talked to Vic Gondotra a little bit. I didn't talk to Andy directly for the book, um, but I had done a piece about Android right before I started writing the book, so I kind of didn't need to, almost. Um, and, and then, but, most of, but most of the information I got from, to, drive, to drive the story came from interviewing people who were really on the front lines of working, uh, working on these projects. Uh, one of the things that I've sort of discovered as a journalist, and maybe this sort of answers your question about sort of the background as a journalist being useful, is that while it's important to get the official view from a company, the official on the record view from a company about what happened. Um, it's usually about less than 10% of, if it's, if it's more than 10% of what's driving your story, you're relying on it too much. And that isn't to say that the companies, that isn't to say that companies lie or cheat or steal. It's just that every company wants to put its best foot forward. Um, every company wants to, therefore, I mean, you would expect every company to, in their on the record comments, give you a very scripted picture of what's going on. You know, when the reality is that, you know, any organization of human beings are filled with uh, um, ups and downs and back and forths. And so I guess I spent a fair amount of time. I, so I really wanted to kind of talk to the people on the ground who were actually experiencing this. Now, the follow-up question to that is, why did I think that these people would actually talk to me? And what I ultimately concluded was that uh, Android, you know, cre the creation of the Android phones and the Android ecosystem and the creation of the iPhone and the iPad changed the course of history. And all these people were an integral part of it. And part of being a really good soldier at all these organizations is working your ass off and uh, letting all the guys at the top take all the credit for it. Um, but that doesn't mean that you like that. Um, uh, and so I thought that if framed correctly, uh, I could get to enough people who would want to talk about sort of their own personal experience being at the center of uh, this enormous change. Um, because, you know, they worked 80 hours a week for 
three years of their life and messed up their health and their marriage and uh, and didn't see their kids and you know all you know, every one of the people who worked on these projects made enormous sacrifices to actually get it done and while there's certainly some people who there's certainly a lot of people who are totally content to be silent about that um, you know human nature being what it is you run into some people who actually would like the world to know so I guess that's sort of a long-winded answer to your question but Thank you. sorry Do we have right here next row right behind you thanks I'm curious about the uh, when when Apple acquired Siri if uh, what, what did the two teams why did they do that? What do the two teams think about the Siri-like technology and how important was it really and how important is it going to be going forward for these platforms? I don't know. How's that? Um, it, it didn't come up. My, 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 I can guess, but that would, I, I could guess, which is that, uh, I think everybody understands that I think both Google and Apple believe that voice activate that voice to text or voice instructions are going to be a critical part of how all these devices how we interact with all these devices going forward um, and so I'm sure that that was what Apple was thinking when it when it wanted to get in when it wanted to get involved there uh, um, but I don't know about the deliberations specifically. It didn't, it didn't come up in the conversations I was talking about. I mean, my own thought is, um, well, this is a really good question for me to ask you guys. Um, do, you all got, do, you, do all you guys think that we're going to um, only interact with our devices by talking to them? Um, or, I, I, I mean, I'm... I'm not I'm not 25, and so um, I never try. I I'm always careful when a new idea and a new way of interacting with systems comes along that everybody says is really cool. Uh, I, I'm always careful not to sort of poo-poo it. But do you guys like to talk to your machines? I found, I've got the Moto X, and the, the voice interaction is great, but I find that the touch interaction is a hard habit to break. That it's just, it, it, it feels more natural. It's what I'm used to. So it, it, it's always the primary. I have to remind myself. Well, this is the thing. Oh, yeah, I can talk to it. I, well, this, well and, and so, but that's my habit, and that's your habit, and so I guess what I was asking was whether or not, like, that's just a habit, or whether or not, whether or not that's just a, a habit, or whether or not that's... Uh, um, the result of the fact that it's really not a good enough uh, experience yet for us to change the way we're doing things. We grew up in science fiction where you're always talking to the computer, right? Yes. In all the shows. I know. And Star, Star Wars and Star Trek and everything. And, but I think it's sort of a, a fool's gold in the real world interaction for the most part. I, my wife laughs at me every night when I tell Siri to set an alarm, and and that's about the only thing that I talk to my phone for. Everything else, you know, is like. I, I mean, I have I buttons. have talked I have talked to Siri when I'm lost somewhere and I need to find a pharmacy and I don't want to crash. But on the um, other hand, with with glass and these less, you know, where there's less touch opportunity, yeah. something else needs to take its place. Well, I mean, in my car, I've had several interactions with uh, specifically with the Moto X, where it has the driving mode it will automatically shift into and it will read text messages to me so over the car stereo i'm hearing text messages as they come in read to me over the the stereo and then prompts me for a response which has been a really great way without my hands ever leaving the wheel without my eyes ever leaving the road that i can have entire conversations by text message that's been great but i think they're to your point they're contextual they're they're specific to the, the, the mode and the moment, um, I, I, I have a hard time believing that my only interaction will be by voice because there are times when I'm in a crowd and I don't want to be broadcasting to the world what it is I'm in the middle of doing. Right, and I'm not so in love with the sound of my own voice um, <laughs> that I actually want to continue, that I actually always want to hear it. Uh, right. 
I mean, actually, the one that I want, the one that I really want, is is where, is is um, you know, the old Star Trek where um, they could actually push a couple of buttons and food would come out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that so, so that was that remains that remains a goal. I mean, that's a that's a that's a laudable scientific goal. I mean, like, put microwaves out of business. It's like so. push a push a push a couple of push a couple of buttons and out comes like hot, you know, burritos. I've got one more question I'd like to ask, but I want to make sure we get, we've got maybe five minutes left. Uh, other questions here in the audience? Here and then maybe right there. I was just going to add into the conversation based on uh, voice and touch. I almost think that voice and touch are going to um, replace, you know, how we interact with the computer now where, you know, we were so used to a mouse and keyboard for so many years and keyboard before that. Uh, now we have the option to touch. So we're going to have an option of touch screen or voice. And I think going forward, when new technologies come out, when Google Glass um, gets a little bit more consumer friendly, and when we have, you know, watches that Apple might come out with, or the one that Samsung come out with, you know, how are you going to interact with a tiny thing on your wrist? It's going to be voice. And I almost think that um, Siri is going to evolve into almost being like your personal assistant, even more than she is now. Um, I know Apple actually a few months ago bought a company called Q that was. Um, basically like a personal assistant app. And I just have to hazard that the same way that they bought Siri to integrate into the next platform, they're going to do the same thing. They're just going to continue to build on that. I think I, 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 don't, I, don't, disagree. I, I, I don't disagree with you, but what I, what, I'm, what I think needs to happen is that the reliability has, I mean, I think what, what the marketing people would tell you about voice, about things like Siri and Google Voice and all that stuff is, and Google Voice is so much better than Siri, but the point about just voice recognition is that, well, it's 99% accurate. Um, but mm -hmm. in order for us to trust it, actually, I mean, if you, it needs to be like five nines. I mean, it has to be 99.9999% accurate in order for us to actually uh, completely trust that it's going to work every, every single time. Um, you know, because even five nines of reliability, somebody once told me, somebody who worked for eBay once told me that like five nines of re reliability is still like hours of downtime every year, um, which is, you know, the same thing with handwriting recognition, right? Uh, um, or, um, yeah, I guess it's, um, it's not handwriting recognition, but um, optical character recognition. Whenever you see on the box it, where it says 99% accurate, uh, that's about two dozen typos in the course of a page. Well, in the course of a 250 word page full of you know, two, two dozen typos is, <laughs> that's a mess. Yeah. Uh, more question back here. Yeah, so really quick. Kind of going to Android, how aware were they of what the iPhone was going to be, and how did that kind of affect um, like the later releases of Android? Because I'm assuming that there was some. Um, I'm sure they kind of had an idea what the iPhone was going to be for a little bit, but like you said, they were going to release like the black pair like device. How did the actual like release affect that first release of Android? Actually, actually, there's a, there's a the the whole second chapter is a little bit of the book is is, is about is is no 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 it's totally fine I mean it's great and really but, dramatic but I love it but the but the answer but the answer is hugely um, I actually don't think that the folks on Android everybody knew that good, that Apple was working on a phone um, nobody on the Android team actually knew what the phone looked like. Um, when they saw what the phone looked like, um, it forced them to completely change the um, traject their whole plan of attack, um, and uh, it part it partly explains why uh, Android came out in 2008 instead of 2000, why the first phone came out in 2008 and not 2007 because they actually had a phone that they were going to release in 2007 and very quickly realized that um, while the software would be superior, um, the phone itself was uh, not well designed enough um, or not cutting edge enough for 
uh, it to be successful, and so they had to reboot. So maybe a good way to conclude this, there was some news this week. Uh, Google bought a Google Ventures portfolio company, Nest. It's the ultimate round trip, isn't uh, it? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> if, I have to imagine if, if you know, as, as the book transitions from the origin stories for both Android and, and the iPhone into what this means as the industry moves ahead, and you spend some time speculating about convergence of entertainment, uh, Hollywood, television, uh, gaming, um, I have to imagine that if the book were coming out like this summer, one of the final pieces that would frame some of that final speculation is what it means that Google bought Nest. Of course, Tony Fidel has quite a prominent role in the first half of the book in the origin of the iPhone. Um, what are your thoughts? What do, you, what do you think it means from your role having researched this book, knowing what you know about Tony, knowing what you know about Larry and Sergey, what does this mean for where things head uh, for Google, for, for Apple, for that matter? Um, it means, um, actually, it, it, only a handful of people have hit this point um, hard, but I'm going to hit it really hard right here. Um, I think that uh, Google buying Nest is probably the, it's certainly the biggest um, decision that Larry Page has made as CEO. Um, it may be one of the bigger strategic decisions that Google as a corporation has ever made. Um, uh, it's certainly, in my mind, more important than buying Motorola, even though it's a third the price. I say all that because what people, what Rick sort of flicked at, but which I'm going to hit even harder, is that Nest is not only run by Tony Fidel, who um, helped conceive and design the iPod, and then grew that into Apple's largest business until he um, helped build and conceive the iPhone. Um, but Nest has, all you have to do is look on LinkedIn, um, half of Nest's staff all used to work at Apple. So there's a reason, and it's quite obvious, from looking at Nest's success, that Tony really understands how to design, build, market, and sell products, ele consumer electronics to consumers. Um, I mean, like a year ago, they were selling 50,000 units a month. So I. I imagine that that's probably closer to 100,000. I mean, you know, this is a company that's three years old. And in three years, they're selling, they're selling like close to 100,000 thermostats a month to people. I mean, that's bananas. Um, <laughs> um, it's also something that nobody inside Google knows how to do. Um, and Google has tried. Uh, but the DNA of the corporation is not organized around that kind of mindset. In fact, um, I was, Rick and I were talking before this all started. There's a story that maybe you guys have heard, but I'll repeat it anyway. Um, when Google was first starting out, uh, one of the, I think it was one of the members of the board, like commissioned uh, a bunch of very, very fancy marketing consultants to develop a marketing plan for how Larry and Sergey were going to get their word out about Google, the search engine, and whatnot. And one of the people on the, on the consulting, consulting team was Sergio Zyman, who had been the former head of marketing at Coke. I mean, it was a very high-powered group of people. Um, they came in to present to Larry and Sergey, and they both looked at it and said, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. Um, why do we want to spend money on marketing? The internet will allow word of, 
if we have our if our product is really really good and we think it is word of mouth on the internet will uh, convince people to use it the fact that it's free especially will allow people to use it proved to be one of the more, more prescient decisions that Larry and Sergey have made uh, in the time that they've been running the company um, but it also confirmed for them their already their their belief that marketing and sales was a complete waste of time um, and Google has been run enormously successfully with that whole point of view um, now as the world sort of evolves beyond just software um, on through the browser but into apps that run on devices whether or not they be phones or whatever wind up on our wrist or in our ear or a bar never mind um, <laughs> um, understanding how to sell understanding how to manufacture market sell uh, design devices for that, that people actually want to give you money for is a skill that Google really needs to have and to um, master um, Tony is the first person uh, Tony I think is the only person maybe besides Steve Jobs that Larry and Sergey respect enough um, on that particular topic uh, to actually go okay this doesn't make any sense to us but you're so good at it why don't you take it why don't you take it and so now Tony works for now Tony works for Google and I think it's going to be really really interesting to see uh, how that materializes because that DNA is going to start to filter through Google's whole approach to selling products and so I suspect you will not see very many um, Nexus Qs, um, Chromebooks, um, uh, even the Nexus One which was de well designed just badly sold um, I mean, you know, Google TVs um, coming out of coming out of Google. I, what I mean is, you're probably not going to see too many uh, consumer product flops coming out of Google from here on in. Um, and so, I think that that's if I'm Tim Cook at Apple, I'm paying very, very close attention to this. Well, I, on that note. Um, for those in the room, please do pick up your copies of the book. Uh, as Graham said, I couldn't put it down once I started. Um, thrilled to have had Fred's time uh, shed a lot more light on a number of topics that are covered uh, in the book. I, I predict you'll all find it as, as engaging and, and intriguing as, as we did. Um, Fred, thank you again for taking the time. Really thank appreciate you. you having me out. Thank you all. Um, Subscribe to the YouTube channel, Google Ventures on YouTube, uh, gv.com slash library for this and other videos. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon.